The first three centuries of the Christian church era, uh, I don't know if you will ever see them repeated again, but irrespective, regardless of the horrendous persecution that the church endured, the message of the gospel was unstoppable. Many scholars believe that Rome killed in the neighborhood of 10 million Christians, sake, simply for the sake of the faith, yet the gospel was unstoppable. I spoke with a, an archaeologist. He said, we have evidence that before the first century was over, before the turn of the first century, the gospel of Jesus, the news about Jesus, had reached all the way to the mountains of Everest, to Nepal right before the first century was out. When Paul was writing his letter to the Colossians, he says that all of creation has heard the gospel. So an incredible aura, an incredible climate was, and I, again, like I said, it is very difficult to, to envision what Paul was saying, all of creation has heard the gospel. You know, in all honesty, we're living at a at a time with incredible amount of technology at our fingertips. And yet, our research, our report shows that over three billion of world's population are still not reached for the kingdom. So, with that perspective, the church, the message of Christ, was wildfire. So for three centuries, Rome did everything to stop the spread of this news. Then they realized it's not working. And so it began a new strategy of dealing with Christianity. Romans began to pull back and gave levels of freedom to the Christian church. Christians began to congregate freely. They began to build churches and monasteries and so forth. There was a sigh of relief. They deserved it. Three centuries of horrendous persecution. But what happened... Around 300s A.D., when the church was given levels of freedom and legality, Christians began to turn their focus from the unreached missions of the world, but they began to turn their focus on each other. And one thing you know, Christians began to decree dogmas against each other. And one thing you know, the Christian church began a campaign of persecution against its own. And not long after this, by the end of 300s, there began a, a campaign of persecution that started, resulted in the killing and annihilation of Christians. Huge rifts began to open up in the Christian church. By 400s, the central dominant churches of Rome began to dictate dogma to the all other French churches, Alexandria, Antioch, Persia, Baghdad. And those regions began to pull themselves away from the central dominant churches of, of Rome. One of the sad things that was happening, which is an incredible event, but I think very few Christians uh, have this in perspective, you know, when we discuss the church history. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this area. The name Cappadocia is mentioned in the scriptures, but in, in, uh, it is centered in the central part of today's Turkey, way to the north, away from Europe, away from Central Europe. By 500 AD, hundreds of thousands of Christians began to migrate out of Christian Europe. I know it's very difficult for us to envision today, but they started migrating out of Central Europe into these volcanic rocks and lived in these communities, incredible communities, for the next 400 to 460 years. Why did they do this? Well, if you see some of the walls of these caves, you would notice primitive paintings and drawings of the stories of the gospel. The miracles of Jesus, quotation from the, from the books of the, of the gospel on the walls of these caves. You're like, why were they doing this? Well, the reason that so many thousands of Christians migrated out of Europe into these volcanic rocks, leaving their homes, leaving their comfort of Europe into these areas, 
because they wanted to preserve the gospel for the coming generations. Because the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, was not being heard in Christian Europe by 500. And so genuine Christians began to flee Europe, moved into these caves to preserve the gospel for the coming generation. But the, the most, I would say, critical thing that was missing in the Christian church is that by 700s, by, by 7th century, mid-600s, you were not hearing the news of Jesus' return anymore. I know it's very difficult for Adventists to envision this, but there was a time in Christian church history, which is over a thousand years, that the news of Jesus' return was not a thing for people to hear anymore. Whereas in the first three centuries, when the church was being persecuted horrendously, the greetings in the streets and the bazaars between Christians was Maranatha, sister, how are you? Maranatha, brother, how are you? Maranatha, in the Aramaic language, meant the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. But by 7th century, you don't hear the Lord is coming. Why? Because the Church of Rome had established itself in Porium Millennium, which means the Millennial Kingdom. So there is no need for Jesus to come back. In a nutshell, this was the state of the Christian church by 7th century. Now, away from everything that was going on in Europe and the seven messages to the seven churches of, of the book of Revelation is very familiar to us Adventists, the condition of the church, the, the derailing of the church is very much addressed in those messages of Christ to the church. Away from all this, in the northwestern corner of Saudi Arabia was a community that were known as the Hanif. And they were there from the time of Ishmael. This community, a very unique community, I, I'll share some descriptions with you. For the sake of time, I'll try to jam in as much information as I can. This community had very, very unique characteristics. Let's read a little about them. Christian historian Samuel Muffet, in the left corner, he writes, the Nestorian Christians, Nestorian Christians were the Christians that basically spread out to the east, to Persia, to Iraq, and then later on to India, and they followed one of the church fathers by the name Nestorios. Nestorian Christians of Hirta, on the border of Iran and Iraq, formed a close community calling themselves servants of God whose inner unity transcended traditional Arab tribal differences. Now this community is also described through Muslim historian by the name Ishmael Farouqi in his Muslim history. Notice how he describes this community. Both Jews and Christian migrants to the desert, meaning to Arabia, and to that whole region that is technically known as the Middle East today, found a ready welcome among those Arabs who upheld the Mesopotamian Abrahamic tradition. Together, now this is very interesting, the Jews and the Christians of this community, including the Arabs that lived there already, that did not belong to either Judaism or Christianity, Together, they consolidated that tradition in peninsular Arabia, which came to be known as Hanifiya. Its adherents, its followers, the Hanifs, resisted every association of other gods with God, refused to participate in pagan rituals, and maintained a life of ethical purity above reproach. The Hanifs always stood above tribal disputes and hostilities. There was this unique community of believers, which I don't know if we can envision that today, but there was a time in history that all the Abrahamic faiths, including Jews, Muslims, Christians, according to historians, they worshipped together in one community, and the direction, pretty much the general location of it was, you know, on the borders of Iran and Iraq. And according to historians, this community was so unique, they did not adhere to rituals of paganism that had crept into Abrahamic faiths by then. 
They stood above disputes. They were known to be pure faith. The word Hanif in the, in the Arabic language means true faith. This community was in existence while Christian Europe was going through all these hybrid movements that were generally addressed by the Lord in the book of Revelation. And we see the conditions of, of you know, very dire situation in the Christian church. While that was going on, this community had formed in Saudi Arabia. Now, how does this community relate to us? I want to share with you a few points. By the way, how many of you have your Bibles with you? We're going to be using some Bibles today. So allow me to give you some introduction. In Galatians 1, verses 15 to 17, we have a very, very peculiar statement by Paul. Paul is reminiscing on that experience that happened to him on the road to Damascus when the Lord Jesus appeared to him while Paul was on his journey, on his mission to arrest and officially kill Christians when the Lord appeared to him, blinded him. Basically, you know, he lost his sanity when, when he saw this scene and when he was confronted by the Lord. Now, years later, as he's reminiscing on this experience, this is what he's sharing with the Galatian audience. Pay close attention to what Paul is writing. Verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by His grace to reveal His Son in me that I might preach Him among the heathen. Now pay close attention. That I may preach Him among the heathen. There's a, the other term for the word heathen in the Greek Bible is gentilos or gentile, which we call the Gentiles. Nevertheless, the heathen immediately... I confronted not flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went, some translations say right away, I went into where? Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. So my question would be, why in the world did Paul go to Arabia before he began his ministry? Why did he go right away after that incident, that basically earth-shattering incident of meeting the risen Lord face to face, he says, before I did anything, that means before I wrote a single word, before I even went to the apostles in Jerusalem, he says, I went to Arabia. Now, a point to remember, some of these little nuances in the scripture, some of these details really have a huge role in us being able to see the grand imagery. Sometimes we skip over some of these, I would say, peculiarities, and it catches up with us later on. Question is, why in the world did Paul go to Arabia? He says, and it's very descriptive in the order of events, the sequence of events. He says, before I did anything, before I even went to the apostles in Jerusalem, in other words, before I was known as Paul to the people, I went to Arabia. Well, what we discussed so far in Arabia was a unique community of believers from the time of Ishmael. And they were known as the Hanifs. Is it possible that Paul went to this community in Arabia? And when he was in this community, what did he do? After all, he is very adamant for his audience to know what he did. He said, before I did anything, I went to Arabia. Is it possible God told him to go to Arabia? And if he was in Arabia, according to what he says, what did he do in Arabia? Do you have your scriptures with you? Open to 2 Corinthians. I'd like us to read some passages that might be familiar to some of us and might be not so familiar to some. Open to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If you have it open, say amen. amen. Go to verse 32, just basically the last two verses of this chapter. I'll read from the King James Version. You can read in any version. 
Notice what Paul says. In Damascus, the governor under Aritas, the king, kept the city of the Damascenians, meaning the residents of Damascus, with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. The word apprehend, piazzo, in the Greek means to capture me, to, to lay their hands on me for the, the one purpose of killing. Verse 33, and through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hand. Paul has gotten a king very irate, very aggravated, willing to kill him. King Aritas is mentioned here. Do you know who King Aritas was? King Aritas was the king of Arabia. How do you get a king aggravated enough to kill you? What did Paul normally do to aggravate the people that just so that they were enough, convicted enough to kill him, to stone him. What was the one crime he perpetrated? He preached Christ. And according to the scriptures, many times he was almost killed. Ultimately he was killed. But we have incidents that he was, he was tried to kill, to stone, to, to, to attack by knives, to attack by you know, a whole host of things because he was preaching Christ. And in this case, it happens, he got the Arabian king after him. Why? Because he was doing the same thing he was doing for the rest of his life. He was preaching Christ. But it is so interesting. According to him, according to Paul, he began his ministry by sharing Jesus with the folks in Arabia before he did his own people, and the rest of the Gentiles in Rome. And the scriptures attest to this fact. From this community, which also is very familiar for another very important fact. In Galatians, again, chapter 4, verse 25. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai. Where? Where does the Bible say? In Arabia. Now this is another peculiarity. Why are thousands and thousands and millions and millions of Christians going to Israel to look at a range of mountains, calling it the mountain of God, Mount Hermon, Mount Har, this is Mount Sinai, whereas the Bible says Mount Sinai is where? It's in Arabia. What I'm trying to introduce, as I said at the beginning of the lesson today, this is an introduction to what we will be discussing later on in the service. But what we see in the scriptures, some clear stated facts that by and large have not been addressed the way they deserve to be addressed. In this letter to the Galatians, Paul is very adamant to share the audience with the audience that before he began his ministry, God called him to do another ministry to the heathen, to those who did not come from the Israel, did not come from the Jewish sect of Abraham, but came from the eastern progeny of Abraham, which were at this time already established in Arabia. And Paul is reminding his audience that, hey, Mount Sinai, just in case you're wondering, Mount Sinai is also in Arabia. From this community of the Hanifs, from this community that stood apart from the rest of what was going on in Christian Europe, and this unique community that was a, a comprise, it was a, an amalgamation of all the Abrahamic faiths, according to historians and archaeology, from this community rose what became known today as the religion of Islam. Now, before I continue, here's a disclaimer for now and for the second service. I am not here to condone or recommend or condemn or compare or promote the religion of Islam or anything that has to do with the religion of Islam, the prophet or the scriptures. What I want to share with you is biblical perspective. A larger perspective as to why the Adventist movement is here. Why God raised the Seventh-day Adventist movement? Is it just to become another denomination among Christianity? 
or is this for a much bigger purpose? And this is what I would like to relate. This is what I'd like to share with you, both as a missionary and as a pastor. I'd like to bring this paradigm, this perspective to you today, this morning, that God has raised the Adventist movement to finish the work of the Great Commission. Not to stand on the sidelines, not to become another denomination, but to finish the incredible work that the Christ of Israel and of the church began 2,000 years ago. In order for us to be able to finish the work, we need to know what God has been doing, what God is doing, and what God will do. We want to be in footsteps. We want to be in sync with what God is doing and not reinvent the wheel on our own. This is why reaching over 3.5 billion unreached sector of the world has taunted us, has stared us in the face, because in some respects, we have not been fully committing ourselves to biblical perspective. And so this is what I would like to share this morning with you. Some of these little nuances, some of these little details. But I will try to expand as much as I can within the sermon time this morning. Let me share with you a passage from the Quran, the Islamic scripture, about the state of the Christian church by 7th century when Islam came on the scene. This is a passage, it's a conversation between God and Jesus, basically on the day of judgment. Notice what it says. And when God will say, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to the people, take me and my mother as gods besides God? Did you tell the folks that you and your mother are gods? So in an overall question, what sect of Christianity do you think this passage of the Quran is referring to, addressing to? Hmm? Speak. Church, of all Christian denominations, what denomination do you know that considers Jesus mother as God? The papal church, right? So what we're seeing was happening at the time Islam came on the scene, this was the prevalent mindset among Christianity. And this prevalent mindset did not only conf get confined to the Roman aspect of it, but also to all the Eastern and also to the Orthodox churches that had spread out to the East, all the way to China. The question that remains, what was happening in the Christian world needed to be addressed. But since it was not being addressed by Christians, it's becoming addressed by the Eastern progeny of Abraham. And the issue is, oh Jesus, did you tell the folks that Mary is God? Now I have a question for you. If that question was posed today, what would be the answer? What is Jesus' answer, in your opinion? Did you tell people that my mother is a God? The answer is no. What we're seeing in the pages of the Quran were the realities that were prevailing, that the, the state of the Christian church, that if we pay attention to the messages of the seven churches in the book of Revelation, basically is addressing all the deformation, all the derailing, all the abuse and all the corruption that had crept into the Christian church is addressed by the Lord himself very discreetly. Outside world was also seeing what was going on in the Christian church and it's been addressed in the pages of the Quran as well. Namely, one of them, the divinity of what became known in the papal church as Theotokos. Theotokos means if Mary gives birth to God, that means she must be God. So this revealed a whole issues of problems that are also addressed being seen by the Eastern progeny of Abraham. I want to read the following statements on the screen. If you agree with what I read on the screen, you're free to say amen. There is one God. Church, come on. There is one God. Thank you. Bible is inspired. Amen. Jesus is the Messiah. Amen. He is the Word of God. Amen. Jesus gives life. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Amen. 
You see, everything you said amen to are statements in the Quran, the Islamic scripture. Many of us would have complexes. Many of us would have issues to say amen to anything that comes out of the Islamic scripture. But if it corresponds to the truth of the Bible, truth remains truth no matter where you find it. Very brief, the Protestant Reformation has a huge amount to say about issues that are very, very much needed today, and, and I'd like to share some of these viewpoints. You see, in the 1500s, when the Protestant Reformation was in its infancy, Catholics had begun reading the scriptures, and they were turning the world upside down. They were taking bold steps following what the scripture says and not what tradition of man. When, as a result of this, the Roman Church began an, a campaign that was multi-layer campaign to just basically undo and to just snuff out the Protestant reformers. It had all the military in the world, all the real estate in the world. On the other hand, Protestant reformers, poor, weak, always on the run, always refugees, fugitives, and the only thing that they had was the support of a handful of aristocrats. Had it not been for God's intervention, the Protestant Reformation would have been destroyed. I'd like to share some details during the service on this issue, but God used the Muslim Ottoman Empire to protect the Reformation. And as a result of that protecting the Reformation, we are all sitting here today. I will share more details of it during the service. As someone who is engaged in the Islamic harvest, why do I call it the harvest? Because I believe the Adventist church needs the missing element of the Eastern progeny of Abraham to finish the work of evangelizing the world. Based on research, based on conviction, and based on what I am experiencing in the field, I propose that Islam is here for two reasons. Historically, Theologically, Islam is here, one, to guard the Bible as they did during the Protestant Reformation and to guard the true church as they have done in the past. And I will share examples of how God has used the descendants of Ishmael to protect his own people. A brief experience I'd like to share with you. About four years ago, um, when the news of ISIS, radical Islam, and all the gory videos and all the horrific atrocities that they were perpetrating across Iraq and Syria became everyday news in the US, I was visiting a mosque in Huntsville, Alabama, with, along with about 20 other Adventist pastors. It was during the month of Ramadan, which Muslims fast for 30 days during the waking hours. And so in evening time, they will break the fast. And so this mosque invited us to join them for a fast-breaking dinner in the evening, that Saturday evening. When we went to the mosque, over 600 Muslim men, women, young, old, together, they had fasted together, had not left the mosque. They were in the mosque, and now they were break, about to break the fast together. I leaned over to my superior, Pastor Ernest Castillo, the vice president of NAD, and I asked him, Pastor Castillo, when was the last time you saw 600 Adventists fasting with each other, not leaving the church and breaking the fast together? That's another day, story for another day. But we're sitting across the table, I'm sitting across the table as we are, you know, engaged in dinner. The food was out of this world. In front of me were sitting a Palestinian, an Egyptian, and a Moroccan Muslim. Uh, various ages, very vigorous, very convicted in, in their religion, in their faith. Obviously, our conversation developed around the war that was going on in the region of Middle East, and the ISIS, and radical Islam, and so forth. So for about 20, 30 minutes, we were, discussed, we were discussing politics and so forth. And then after about, maybe about 30 minutes of discussion, I decided to change the direction of the conversation. And so without consulting with my superiors, I leaned over to the table 
to the Palestinian Muslim and I said, what do you think of Jesus? And you should see the, the looks on some of our pastors' faces, you know, as they were eating, one went, they're going to kill us, you know, they're going to. The man that I asked the question, he was eating at the same time that I asked him the question. He put his fork and spoon down, he pushed the plate back, he buttoned his jacket, he sat straight, and looked straight in my eyes and he says, Jesus, he's a special prophet for us Muslims. I said, what makes him special? He said, he's unique. There's no one like him. And I can see the ice is melting in our camp, you know, sigh of relief, you know. I said, where is Jesus? He was kind of intimidated by this question, you know, as if you should know, why are you asking me this? He says, in heaven, of course, everybody knows it. He is standing closest to God's throne. No one is closer to God's throne than Jesus. Here's a Muslim that has just fasted. I said, what does he do in heaven? He kind of ran his fingers in his beard and he said, he's enjoying himself. <laughs> I said, besides enjoying himself, what does he do in heaven? Kind of ran his fingers and he says, we don't know. The Quran doesn't tell us. We know he's in heaven. Here we were, 20 Adventist pastors, with the message of the sanctuary, of what Christ is doing on behalf of humanity. And so, many of our, many of our pastors were kind of pleasantly shocked. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. Now, the whole community that is sitting around this table, everybody is riveted on this guy. And at the end, I asked him, so what is next for Jesus? What are we to expect? He opened his arms like this, and in Arabic, he said, Insha'Allah, God willing, we are waiting for his return. What? The next day, we are in Oakwood University. We're having a board meeting, and the Vice President of the North American Division at the time was Pastor Ernest Castillo. He got up and he said, gentlemen, before we do any business today, did you hear what this man said at the mosque last night? They're waiting for Jesus to come back? Aren't we waiting for Jesus to come back? Then if we have the same hope, why are they there and we're here? Why are we enemies? And that's the reason why I'm here today. The whole perspective, the biblical perspective, is very clear for us. God's dealings are very, very detectable. And what we want to do, being the people that God has raised this movement to be, and how the Muslims are perceiving us to be, demands for the church to re-examine what is it that we're not doing and we have to be doing according to what God is doing rather than preaching the three angels message only to Christian background people and wonder why Jesus is not back yet could it be an opportunity for us today to reconsider some of that and be convicted of the fact that God has raised this movement to finish the work, yes, including evangelizing 1.7 billion Muslims. A Muslim cleric, speaking to one of my colleagues, he said, we understand you guys don't eat pork. We don't eat pork. He said, you're against drinking alcohol. So are we. He said, you don't smoke. He paused a little bit. He said, we know we're not supposed to smoke. He said, I've never seen a Christian that does not eat bacon or drink beer or wine. You guys are Christian and you don't do any of that. He said, are you sure you're not Muslim? 
God has raised this movement to do incredible things. And this incredible thing also includes bringing Jesus in a meaningful way, in a tangible way, in a relevant way to the communities that God has already been working with. Once they come across an Adventist, one Muslim lady said, are there more of you guys? Are you like recently? I said, about 20 million of us. She says, where? I said, that's, a, that's another story for another day. But in perspective, I like to finish with this verse. In the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verse 16, Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must bring them in also. They too will listen to my voice, the Lord says. And when I come, not if I come, when I come, there shall be one flock waiting for their shepherd. What Christ is telling us, first and foremost, this passage is dynamic, meaning every time you read it, it's present tense. Every time you read it, it is in first person. Jesus did not tell us there are other sheep. Go get them. No, no, no. He says, I have other sheep. They're mine. Are we willing to embrace this mindset of the Lord? The Jewish leadership of the time of Jesus, as sincere as they were trying to be, they had a difficult time wrapping their minds around this. How can God have other children and they're not Jew? How can they be, their worship be accepted to Him while they don't worship in the sanctuary? While they don't worship like us? Well, what Christ was telling the Jewish leadership then, he is telling us today. I have other sheep. When I return, there will be people in that flock you least expect to see. I want to be the voice of this shepherd to the other sheep. And in order to do this, we need to look at it from the Lord's perspective to be relevant and to be meaningful when they hear my voice. Rather than alienation, Rather than controversy and debates and arguings and fightings and rifts, reconciliation and for them to know that not only he is the savior of Christians, but he's also their savior. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share. Uh, are there any questions? Two questions if we can, if we can take. Yes, sir. See, there's a lot of conjecture. We don't know for how long he was there. Putting the chronology of his activities, some scholars would say he was about for three and a half years. Some say he was there for seven years. But I've also heard really, really credible um, reports that do claim he was there for about 14 years. But one thing we know, before... Paul became the Paul to the church, he went to Arabia. What did he do there? Well, when you see the little nuances here and there in his letters, he got some people ticked off. And normally, how did, get people, did he get people aggravated? By preaching Christ. You know, by preaching, by doing what he was best at in sharing, sharing the gospel. But it's so interesting, if you notice in the passage... He says, he chose me from my mother's womb to preach his son to the heathen. The heathen, it's, it's very important that in this case, it came before the children of Israel. In other words, he began his ministry outside of Israel, outside of preaching to synagogues. And for how long did he do it? It's, it's, a, it's a matter of guessing, but we know that what, that's what came first. That's what came first, according to his letters. Another question? Yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning to you. You missed the whole point. Sure. 
Uh, my name is Gerald. I normally don't use my last name due to security nature, if you allow me, because I know we're being streamed sometimes. And so just being on the, on the safe side. Uh, I'm an Iranian. I was born in Iran. I moved to the United States after the Islamic Revolution of Ayatollah Khomeini. And through turn of events, through miraculous intervention of God, but most of all, through 20 years of prayer of my mom, I, was, I came to faith in Christ. He, he saved my soul, let's put it this way, for reasons that I will never know why. Um, but pretty soon when I began ministry in Southern California Conference in the early 2000s, I was convicted very soon to start work where there is no work. And so I started planting churches in the Los Angeles area in communities that we did not have Adventist uh, work. But very soon, um, about the year 2007, end of 2007, and that's the double reason why I'm here today, I'm here to also attend my mentor's memorial service at Pioneer Memorial, Dr. Bruce Moyer, who was uh, the director of world missions for the seminary for a number of years. Um, he is responsible for the second stage of my career, of my, of my ministry, that has been focused on reaching Islam. So by becoming engaged with the, with the work of Islam and by his mentorship, uh, by God's grace, now I'm the director for Muslim Ministries for the Pacific Union, and I'm also on the board of advisors to the North American Division in this work. But most, those are, those are all titles, and, and they don't mean anything to me. What means more to me is going to churches every Sabbath, every single Sabbath, to a different church, to a different state, different city, and sometimes different country, to bring this paradigm to our churches that our people would know that God has raised this movement for a much bigger purpose than just to be another Christian denomination among 33,000 Christian denominations. And bringing this from a biblical perspective uh, and nothing but the Bible. Yes. 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 Yeah, because, because we've been, <laughs> by God's grace, you know, a lot of churches, um, once they became exposed to this, and once after we do the seminars and the training, they get very excited, and they record the whole thing, and they pop it on, on Google. And so on Vimeo and YouTube, there's hundreds of clips. And the more, the merrier. We're nowhere near to be as merry as we think we are. And so it needs, it takes every Adventist to realize, number one, that according to the scriptures, every one of us has been given a special grace, special gift from the Lord out of the generosity of Christ. Second, those gifts have to be implemented. They have to be put to use in order for this massive harvest of the unreached people to hear the gospel in a meaningful way, in a relevant way. Most of our efforts, uh, again, I'm in-house, I'm in God's house, I'm among my people, and I have to express this. Most of our efforts is directed to the Christian communities. That needs to change. God is bringing all these foreigners to America including about 10 million Muslims here. And I will share experience, some experiences of recently of my engagement with Muslims, but here's one thing that I have been very, very clear. God has given this movement the authority to finish the work of the Great Commission. And I will exhibit this, and I will illustrate this, what this means. He has given authority to us to finish the work. With that authority, He has given us gifts. But most of my research shows that only 6% of Adventists in our churches in North America, I can't talk for the rest of the world, my concentration has been in North America, only 6% of Adventists are engaged in a meaningful gifts, strengths related ministry. Can a church functioning only on 6% of its members finish the work of the Great Commission? The answer is no. And so these are the focus of, of my ministry, of the work that I do, to bring and to equip our churches for them to realize 
that God has gone before us, behind us, to our sides, and he says, if you don't want to do this work, I will appear to them in visions and dreams, and I will do the work. And he is doing this work. I don't want to miss out on this opportunity. I don't want my church to miss out on this opportunity. Sure. Yes. I'm not saying take the focus off. I'm just saying, no, 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 not even adjustment. See, when God has given you the potential, whatever it is, right? If you use half your potential, does the other half still function? Does the other half still do its work? No, it doesn't. The only the half potential that you're utilizing gets cultivated, gets trained, gets you know, embellished, and the whole thing. The other half doesn't. And guess what? The other half, if unused, it goes dormant, and pretty soon you'll even forget that you either were equipped with the other half. That's, that's all I'm saying. The, the focus should be where it is, but this other focus that God has blessed us with that focus has to get in gear. It has to get activated. So my, my observation is this, that in our world of politics, mm, mm, politics mm. plays a big role in why as Christians, some of the ethnic Christians, we are not more involved yes. in Muslim immigration. Yes. We have too many issues yes. as American and Jewish relations yes. point of stubborn or something else. Yes. Exactly, exactly. That's it, that's it. This is why I believe in equipping our members personally. Because many of you rub shoulders, work with, your bosses are Muslim, you're at a hospital that your patients are Muslim, your neighbors are Muslim. It has to boil down to that personal level. If it's at a corporate level, I, I think we're past that. We've, we've missed that deadline. What we need to do is focus on our members, on a personal relationship, establishing this personal, I would say, I don't want to use the term field or harvest because it always gives us the connotation that we're there. I'm going to become friends with you because I want to get you dipped. That's the only person, the reason I'm befriending you. This art of friendship needs to be cultivated by our members, you know, on personal level, on personal basis. So, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the political aspect of it not only is preventing us, it's crippling us. It's crippling us. And it's getting way more solidified by the day, by the day. This is why we do the work that we do, you know, because I... I've been exposed to a great response from Muslims from different parts of the world. Am I being streamed right now? Am I being streamed right now? Am I being streamed right now? Okay, are you sure? Okay, so I will hold some of my comments afterwards because... Thank you so much for the opportunity. Blessings to you. Do we pray? You have your hand up. Please forgive me. Yeah. Father, we praise you, we thank you, and we rejoice in who you are. Thank you for this privilege to walk into your house, into your presence. Help us to ever be mindful that this is the house of the living God. And so, Father, may the meditations of our hearts, may the words of our mouth, may our attitudes, may our actions, may our interactions, and may our fellowship bring glory to your name and blessing to each other. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen.